This is Passiflora incarnata, a herbaceous vine native to many areas in the southeastern United States, and you may better recognize it by some of its common names, such as Passionflower, Maypop, or Holy Trinity Flower. The names Passionflower and Holy Trinity Flower derive from early Catholic missionaries in South America who used the flowers to teach about the crucifixion of Jesus. The three stigmas represent the nails, the five anthers represents the five wounds that Christ received, and the fringed corona represents the crown of thorns placed upon his head. Passiflora incarnata is widely known for medicinal uses that originated with Native Americans to treat insomnia, anxiety, and epilepsy. Now, compounds that cause these medicinal effects have not entirely been defined, but one study suggests that it produces higher amounts of gamma aminobutyric acid, or better known as GABA, when compared to 20 other plants. And GABA is thought to play a major role in controlling nerve cell hyperactivity associated with anxiety, stress, and fear, which gives us a better understanding of some of its medicinal effects. The purple passionflower is a perennial plant in the family Passiflora ACA, also known as the passionflower family. And this family is characterized by herbaceous tendrilled vines and flowers with an elaborate fringed corona overlaying a flat ring of petals with a superior ovary. And the flowers exhibit various hues of white and purple throughout their parts that create a bullseye pattern, which we will discuss later in the video. It also presents itself as axillary with radial symmetry, meaning its floral parts are evenly arranged from a central point. And if you're searching for this flower, look during June, July, August, and September in prairies, savannas, riverbanks, and streams that receive direct sunlight. For example, I found this purple passion flower in east central Texas in an ecoregion called the post oak savanna, which has many floodplains and savannas with soils that are a mixture of sandy and clay loam, both of which can be tolerated by the purple passion flower. Now that we've covered the basics, let's take this flower back to the lab to examine some of its intricate parts under the microscope and get a better grasp of its complexity and beauty while also discussing a bit of its evolutionary biology. Now what we are looking at here is the top of the flower, and it's where the passion flower presents its reproductive parts. The reproductive parts of the passion flower are much larger and easier to identify than some of the flowers we have discussed previously, and we're going to go ahead and start with talking about the male anatomy. The arm-like section we're zooming in on is called the filament, and the filament holds up the anthers which contain small pollen granules that carry the male gametes. Now this filament is a crucial part of the male anatomy because it holds the anthers at the perfect position for relatively large pollinators like carpenter bees to pick up pollen on their backs, which they will hopefully transport to the female reproductive parts. Which then brings us to our next topic, which is the female anatomy. This beautiful arm we are zooming in on is called the style, and similar to the filament holding the anthers, it holds a crucial female organ called the stigma. The stigmas on the passion flower are large pads at the end of the style with a sticky surface created by secretions of proteins, fats, and sugars. This sticky surface allows for the attachment of pollen granules, leading to the development of a pollen tube that transports pollen down the style to the ovaries where fertilization occurs and the passion flower is then produced. With this passion flower, we can see that the pollen has attached to the stigma and that the ovaries have already started producing a small passion fruit in the center of the flower. The young fruiting body has small hairs or trichomes, which then defend it by producing chemicals like flavonoids, terpenoids, or alkaloids to ward off herbivores. And this is a common adaptation among many fruits, which is why some fruits like peaches are fuzzy to the touch. And the concept of fertilization and interactions between the anthers, stigma, and pollinators might seem simple, but they wouldn't be possible without the extravagant floral parts produced by the passion flower. For it is these parts that attract pollinators in the first place. And starting with the petals, we can zoom in to see individual cells of various shades of purple produced by the plant. And the purple color of the passion flower has been selectively chosen by pollinators over time. For example, carpenter bees, which primarily pollinate this flower due to the height of its anthers and stigma, have exerted selective pressure on its color. And this is mainly because studies have shown that bees prefer blue and purple hues, which aligns with the passion flower's coloration. 
This mutual influence between the flower and its pollinators is known as coevolution, a topic we will discuss later in the video. Next to the petals is the fringed corona, which is my favorite part of the flower, and it is largely what gives it its exotic look. And as you can see, as the fringed corona gets closer to the center of the flower, it produces white and lighter shades of purple. Now this combined with the petals creates a bullseye pattern, signaling pollinators to land on the flower. This bullseye pattern is hard for us to see, but is extremely noticeable under UV spectra, which is the wavelength many bees use to view light. These filaments guide pollinators into the nectaries at the center of the bullseye, which produces nectar as a reward for pollinators landing on the flower. And as insects forage on the nectar, they will then hopefully interact with the reproductive parts, making the plant's investment in the flower worthwhile. These flowers also don't only attract pollinators, but they also attract ants and form a symbiotic relationship. Ants feed on the nectar just like bees, but instead of inducing fertilization, the ants will protect this food source from various herbivores that may try to eat the passion vine. And for the most part, the ants do a good job at protecting this vine from many herbivores except for one infamous caterpillar. This caterpillar is the Gulf Fritillary Caterpillar. And if you've ever seen a passion flower, you can assume that there will be one nearby. Gulf Fritillary Butterflies will exclusively seek out passion vines to lay their eggs because these caterpillars have evolved to assimilate the toxic chemicals produced as a defense by the passion flower for their own defense against predators. And the vibrant orange colors and black spikes also provide a warning so that predators know they should probably go eat something else. The relationship between the Gulf Fritillary caterpillar and the passion flower is a process known as coevolution. And coevolution involves reciprocal evolutionary changes between pairs of species as they interact with one another. In the case of the passion vine and our caterpillar, all this means is that when one species evolves a new defense mechanism, the other species evolves a way to overcome it, and this cycle continues. This relationship is quite common in nature. In fact, many caterpillars have evolved to be solely dependent on specific habitats and even on particular genus or species of plant due to this process. And I think it's incredibly fascinating to learn about the relationships between species like the passion flower and the gulf fritillary butterfly. It makes you wonder what the gulf fritillary caterpillar would do if the passion flower ceased to exist. We would hope it could adapt to another host plant, but this highlights just how interconnected and invaluable some organisms are to each other. It's hard to comprehend but there are hundreds of thousands of relationships like this in nature that we haven't even discovered yet. And these relationships involve many organisms and delicate interconnected systems, all codependent on one another. When you're outside today, I hope that you remember some of the things we discussed and begin to make connections between the various organisms you see every day. They are probably more interconnected than we think. See if you can identify any processes of coevolution happening right in front of you. Because the more I learn about these relationships, the more I realize how little I truly understand. So again, I ask that you just take a moment to appreciate the subtle and complex interactions happening all around us by observing the beauty and complexity of the world that we live in. I hope you enjoyed taking a closer look at the passion flower today, and I wanted to thank you for taking the time to discuss some of the evolutionary biology and ecology of this organism. Please comment down below if you learned anything new or if you know of any examples of coevolution similar to the ones between the passion flower and the gulf fritillary butterfly. And please subscribe if you would like to see more videos like this, and I hope you have a good day.